Hi, welcome to our new vocabulary lesson. This time is going to be focusing on word use. How does the word use change? What a word means can be changed, can be stretched, or limited by the way it is used. How? Through different means. Through something called metaphors, through idioms, through collocations, through style, and also through multiple meanings that a word might have. Let's start with metaphors. Read the following and focus on the way these words are used. Three words, ill, sick, and wounded. Charles was ill, or Charles was ill at ease, but had no way of explaining the true reason of his, of his unhappiness to his new bride. Sick at heart, he continued to give unconvincing apologies. Matilda's pride was wounded, as she was unable to understand his distress. Notice these three red highlighted words, ill, sick, and wounded. These are very familiar words. I guess you know their meanings. How are they used in this text? Does the meaning you could figure out here confirm to the meaning that you already know? Charles was ill at ease. Is it the dictionary meaning? The simple meaning you already know? Someone who's ill, that is someone who, who's, who doesn't feel well, who has some kind of sickness, disease? Actually, it doesn't seem to be that meaning here. He was ill at ease. He was in an embarrassing situation to a certain extent. Sick at heart. Does this mean that he has a heart disease? Obviously not, if we focus on the whole situation here. Someone having some kind of pain in heart some kind of a painful feeling. And wounded, does it really have the dictionary meaning of injured? The one we already know? Its use in this sentence shows a bit of different meaning. It's her pride this time that's wounded. So it's obviously a metaphor. It's an imaginary meaning showing another situation. She was embarrassed, she, was, she felt pain, as if she were wounded. Another feature, which is very important and very near metaphors, it's idioms. One of the most difficult aspects of a language to master is the usage of idiomatic expressions. Idiomatic expressions are phrases that carry a specific meaning within the language. For example, and this is a very common example, it's raining cats and dogs. Do we really see cats and dogs coming out of the sky? Actually not. It's an expression used by native speakers to describe heavy rains. A second example, mind your own business. You might say it to a student, you might say it to a child, to someone who has never done any business. To just mean, just keep away from this topic or from this thing, just don't uh, get involved in that. Normally, there is no logical way of translating these expressions word by word. The only way to learn them is to memorize them and to practice their use. Practice makes perfect. 
The more you practice these expressions, the better you will understand them and use them. Let's do some exercise. Read the following sentences and try to figure out the meaning of the idioms included. Example 1. Bob lost his job, but somehow his family weathered the storm. What can the meaning of weathered the storm be? Example 2. He got into hot waters when he revealed the secret. Take a few seconds to think about it. Do you think he was immersed in hot waters? He's taking a hot bath. And example three. After that terrible incident, the house ended in smoke. What could it be the meaning of ended in smoke? The last example. She bit her lip for not studying well. Did she really bite her lip? Choose the correct meaning of the idiom. Let's remember example one, where the man lost his job, so his family could weather the storm, or but his family could weather the storm. Does that mean that they could survive the crisis? Or they could criticize someone? Or they were, they were introverts, or they were able to guess correctly. Is it A, B, C, or D? Think about it. They could weather the storm actually means they could survive the crisis. He lost the job, he seems to be the father or the breadwinner of the family, so when he lost the job, it should logically lead to a crisis in the family. But they could weather the storm, they could survive, they could manage it. Number two, to get into hot waters. Does it mean bathe in the winter months? Or to get healthy, to get rich? or to get into trouble. Remember the example, these people got into hot waters when they revealed the secret. The context shows that the answer is D. They got into trouble when they revealed the secret. They shouldn't have done this. To end in smoke. After that incident, the house ended in smoke. Does that mean smoking too many cigarettes? Or a house burned down? Or face failure? Or a religious ceremony? It's an incident. After that incident, the house ended in smoke. It's an incident that ended in smoke. We might think of some kind of logical relationship here, which helps us guess that it is B, the right answer. The house was burned down. The last example, to bite one's lip, does it mean to be unsure? To feel sorry at someone's plight? To not react despite being angry? or to laugh at someone's misfortune. Remember, she bit her lips for not studying. Obviously, that person had an exam, and we could deduce from the situation that she might have failed her exam. That's why she bit her lips. She didn't study well. So obviously, the answer is to feel sorry for doing something. The third aspect that might change the meaning of words because it's used in a different way is collocations. What are collocations? 
They're actually words that normally go together in written and spoken English. They make your English sound more fluent and native-like. What does it mean, native-like? You feel you are speaking in the same way as native speakers do. And it's when you get a, coll a collocation wrong, when people would say, well, hmm, doesn't sound right. They don't say it like that in English. So why do we need to learn collocations? The tricky part is that there are no English grammar rules stipulating how and when certain words are put together. You simply have to develop the feel of how words are naturally used. You've got to have some kind of a language sense. When you say the thing you feel, does it work well? Did I say it right? You feel it inside you. Basically, you have to learn English collocations and incorporate them into your spoken and written English so as to help yourself get that language sense. How would that happen? Collocations are somewhat similar to English idioms. So just like idioms, they are word combinations that go together, that are used by native English speakers, and you just have to learn those phrases to be able to use them. No grammar rules, sometimes no logical word relations for those combinations. And therefore, you just need to learn them as they are. And for this memorization, let's say to be effective enough, you need to learn or memorize an example, at least one example with every collocation. Here is an example. For instance, when you go back to work after a few days illness, you would tell your work colleagues that you are fully recovered. If you use any other word with recovered, like I'm completely recovered, or uh, oh yeah, I'm absolutely recovered, I'm totally recovered, thank God, doesn't sound as good as the natural collocation, I'm fully recovered. The two words, fully and recovered, are the ones that naturally go together in English language. So we can say that those words collocate with each other. Here is a further list of collocations to help you get started. Have a good time. Do me a favor. Make a difference. You can't say do a difference. Take a break. Break the law. Catch the bus. Save yourself the trouble. Drop out rates. From dawn till dusk. And take your time. Now, why do we need to learn collocations? It's because your language will be more natural and more easily understood. Uh, trying to sum, it up, to sum up what we've said. You will have alternative and richer ways of expressing yourself. And it is easier for our brains to remember and use language in chunks. Or blocks rather than single words. When you learn collocations, you will avoid unnatural combinations that might sound wrong. Have a look at this example. Natural English, and we mean by natural English, the English spoken by native speakers. Natural English says, or native speakers say, the fast train. They would never say the quick train. It sounds unnatural. They would also say fast food and never quick food. Contrastingly, 
The word quick collocates with other words. A native speaker would say a quick shower. He would never say a fast shower, as he would say a quick meal, but never a fast meal. How can you help yourself learn those colloc collocations? We said you need to memorize them, but before that, you need to be aware of them, of their presence in any text you read, and try to recognize them when you see or hear them. You need to treat collocations as single blocks of language, not separate words. Think of them as individual blocks or chunks and learn strongly support, not strongly and support. When you learn a word, write down other words that collocate with it. For example, if you've learned the word remember recently, you can collocate it with remember rightly and note down these collocations in your notebooks to go back to them later. Remember rightly, remember distinctly, remember vaguely or remember vividly. You also need to read as much as possible. Reading is an excellent way to learn vocabulary and collocations in context and naturally. Revise what you learn regularly. Practice using new collocations in context as soon as possible after learning them. And you need to learn collocations in groups that work for you. You could learn them by topic, for example, a list of collocations that go with time, on time, waste time, run out of time, and the list is so long. These are just a few examples. Or you might feel more well at ease learning them by a particular word, collocations that go with the verb to take. For example, take action, take a chance, take an exam. Now we move on to another aspect, another kind of language use. Style. What do we mean by the word style? In linguistics, in language learning and studying, a style is a variety of a language used for a particular purpose or in a particular social setting. So there are different language styles. Each level has an appropriate use that's determined by different situations. Thus, the appropriate language register or style depends upon the audience, the who, the topic, the what, the purpose, the why, and the location, the where. These are important factors to help you determine which language style to use. Learning vocabulary, therefore, involves being able to distinguish between different levels of formality and the effect of different contexts and topics. There are two kinds of styles, two major kinds of styles, not to go into very tiny details. The formal style and the informal style, and we'll start with the formal one. This language is used in formal settings and is one way in nature. This use of language usually follows a commonly accepted format. It's usually impersonal and formal. A common format for this register are speeches, official speeches, sermons, uh, pronouncements made by judges at the court, announcements at the airport, for example. This formal style is characterized by more advanced vocabulary, academic vocabulary, longer and more complex sentences. For example, an introduction between strangers. Here, you need to use a formal kind of language, 
a formal style. And we'll see those examples in details a little bit later. In speeches or pronouncements made by judges, in announcements, in a standard for work, for school, for public offices, businesses, all these settings require formal style. The informal, or sometimes we call it the casual style, it's an informal language used by peers and friends. Slang is allowed, colloquialism is normal. This is actually a group language. One must be member to engage in this register or style. For example, bodies, teammates, chats, emails, blogs, letters to friends. In an informal writing style, we find a more direct language than a formal style. And it may rely more heavily on contractions, which do not exist in formal style. I can't, I want, abbreviations, and short sentences. For example, to refer to death, you might say, he died. Or, more informal, more casual, passed away, passed on, moved on, he expired, croaked, he bought the farm, and this is actually an idiomatic expression, passed from life temporal to life spiritual, he went to meet, uh, sorry, she went to meet her maker, which is a very everyday language, he was taken, or to meet one's end, or perish. So all these expressions can replace the word died. Here comes the opportunity to see a few examples for formal compared to informal. In greetings, for example, in a formal situation, you will say, good morning, I let Dr. Jones know you are here. Whereas in an informal context, you might say, hey Jack, what's up? In requests, you would say, could you possibly type this up for me by tomorrow? Whereas in an informal situation, you might say, watch the door for me, okay? Type this for me, please. In encouragement, you would say, thank you for applying this position. Sorry, thank you for applying for this position. We will let you know in a week if you have been chosen for an interview. Whereas, in an informal situation to encourage someone, you might say, wow, way to go, nice catch. And the last aspect now that's related to word use is multiple meanings. Some words in English may have more than one meaning according to the different situation in which it is used. We'll take just one example here to help you understand how it looks like. If you say, my head hurts, the target word here is head. My head hurts. In another situation, the word head might have a completely different meaning. He is the head of the family. He might be the father. In another context, let's head out. Let's move on. Let's go on. Let's start. Whereas in a completely other different situation, you might say, Keep your head on your shoulders, and this is actually an idiomatic expression. Finally, after dealing with all these aspects of language use, there is a strategy uh, that might help you learn the words, keep them in mind, and pass them to your long-term memory. It's a very simple strategy. Use your body while saying or reading the new word. 
When you associate the word with a body movement, then you will learn it much faster, remember it much longer, and use it more quickly and more easily. To learn new words appropriately, you need to engage with them. So when you use your body, this is a kind of engagement with the words. The movement has to be connected to the meaning. It can be anything that helps you remember. It can either be a physical gesture or a physical expression. And every time you hear the word, read it or say it, try to make the same movement. By doing this, you take the word deeper into your mind. For example, if it's an adjective, you can make your face look like that word. For example, disgusting. Whenever you say the word, you make the same facial expression. This will take it into your deep mind and your long-term memory. Try to make the movement exaggerated in a way to be memorable for you. Now say the word and try to make the movement that you like, that fits for you, that makes you remember. Let's do some practice. What actions or gestures do you use to do the following? Hello. Goodbye. Express anger. Express surprise. Express indifference. Express agreement. These were my facial expressions, my own movements. You can create your own and help yourself remember any words. Finally, I've got some tips for you. Vocabulary learning tip one, read, 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 and read. You want to learn more vocabulary in a more effective way, you need to read. You need to see the vocabulary words in context. Two, Improve your context skills, depicting words and meaning of the words from the context. Three, practice, practice and practice. Four, make up as many associations and connections as possible. And five, use mnemonics, memory tricks. Six, get in the habit of looking up words you don't know. Be curious about words. Seven, play with words, use games. Eight, use vocabulary lists, they are very important. And as a student, grade 11, next year, grade 12, you are going to take the SIPA and you need those lists, especially the academic word list. Nine, take vocabulary tests. And 10, get excited about the words. The more excited about your learning, the better learning happens. Thank you for your attention. See you next lesson.